I would encourage all members uh, to seriously consider uh, supporting. I've had the, the opportunity, and I'm very proud of the area that I represent uh, in, in Winnipeg North. Um, in Winnipeg North, it's an interesting, diverse uh, makeup of, uh, of people, uh, Madam Speaker. One of the largest uh, and growing communities is the, uh, is, uh, the Indigenous uh, community in Winnipeg North. I estimate it probably somewhere between 18 to 20, maybe 20, as high as 22 percent, some areas of the riding a little higher uh, th than, than other. I like to think that uh, going forward as a community in Winnipeg North, that we want and should push and encourage wherever we can uh, reconciliation and take the actions that, that are necessary to ensure that there is more harmony within our society. We have such a, a wonderful, diverse uh, community. And, and for me personally, I think that this uh, bill that we're debating today is, will, be, will go a long way in being helpful. Now, I would suggest to you, Madam Speaker, that it doesn't matter which member of parliament, whatever area of this country uh, that we represent, that the community as Canada will in fact benefit by the recognition of a statutory uh, holiday. I had taken the initiative, and it's not too often that I do this, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, of actually wanting to, to quote something uh, from uh, constituents uh, in regards to a specific uh, bill. And I have actually two quotes that I would like to kind of share uh, with members. And these are uh, from constituents, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, of Indigenous uh, background. When I had indicated to them that I would be debating uh, Bill C-5, the, the need for a statutory holiday, what were their thoughts? And I'd like to share a couple of, of the comments that I received. This comes from one of the constituents, Ma uh, Madam Speaker. As a parent, we teach our children about the Tooth Fairy and Santa. And as children, they eventually outgrow these make-believe images and beliefs. Contrasted to racism and some Canadians' lack of understanding of residential schools, Indian Day schools, and treaties negotiated with my peoples, which are the cornerstone of our nation's legal foundation, many Canadian children are growing up with false or make-believe history which contributes to the latter intolerance we see in hospital beds in Quebec and the Fisherman's Wharf in Nova Scotia. Education is the only solution. Um, just kind of lost my spot there for a moment, Mr. Speaker, M Madam Speaker, and is needed to create understanding. Understanding is the sunlight where racism and falsehoods die. September 30th should be a day where all Canadian people reflect on our true history of the hardships that First Peoples continue to face and the day focused on culture, language, history, understanding, truth and united path of reconciliation. Madam Speaker, um, another, uh, in this case, mother sent me this of Indigenous background. As stated in the TRC report, reconciliation must inspire Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples to transform Canadian society so that our children and grandchildren can live together in dignity, peace and prosperity on these lands we now share. Imagine the opportunities for families, individuals and businesses to grow their understanding and make progress towards reconciliation. To pass this down from one generation to the next. Imagine the events that would be hosted in communities from coast to coast to coast. Reconciliation is every Canadian's responsibility. It is not enough to leave this to certain sectors like education in schools. As a government, as individual, as Canadians, we need to honour the spirit and intent of the call to action number 80 and establish the statutory day of truth and reconciliation in partnership with Indigenous uh, people. Madam, uh, Madam Speaker, um, I actually have a, a very short quote from her 12-year-old uh, daughter, and I would quote, um, and, and her daughter, by the way, had a grandmother that actually went to a residential school, and I quote, 
It would be so much better if everyone could participate instead of just having Orange Shirt Day at school. Um, Madam Speaker, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada um, conducted an extensive uh, public uh, review in terms of what it is that we needed to do in an era of Canada's uh, history that was really important for us uh, to, to try to, to make amends. And uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission came up with 94 recommendations. And if you take a look at all 94 recommendations, 76 of those fall under, at least in part, uh, federal uh, responsibility. And what we have seen over the last number of years is a government uh, with the support in many ways from other parties dealing with issues such as uh, language, such as child welfare. We have seen uh, budgetary uh, measures that have been there to support the principles of reconciliation in different forms. The, rec the call for action that we're talking about today is number 80. And allow me to quote right from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls for action. Um, recommendation 80. We call upon the federal government in collaboration with Aboriginal peoples to establish a, as a statutory holiday a national day for truth and reconciliation, to honour survivors, their families and communities, and ensure that public commemoration of the history and legacy of residential schools remains a vital component of the reconciliation process. Um, Madam Speaker, whether it's my constituents, the calls for action, I believe all of which is good reason to be able for members to, to recognize the value. And we have seen that in different forms. You know, it wasn't that long ago in which I was standing talking about recognizing Philippine Heritage Month or standing in this chamber uh, calling for members of parliament to recognize a um, Sikh uh, Heritage uh, Month, Sikh in Heritage Month in April and the Philippine Heritage Month in June. And if you were to take a look at the number of requests, on many occasions I've stood in my place and I've talked about the importance of heritage and the designation of, of days or weeks or, or months. Here what we're saying is that we need to have a statutory holiday to, to recognize the true value. Um, of what has taken place in order for us to, to move forward and be a part of reconciliation in a positive way, reflect on the many speeches that we talk about in regards to that uh, Canada's great diversity, understand and appreciate the value of what Bill uh, C-5 is offering all of us today as an opportunity to send a strong, powerful message to uh, our Indigenous uh, people. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Questions and comments? Uh, the Honourable uh, Member for Peace, uh, Peace Weaver Westlock. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and I want to thank the Honourable colleague for his speech. Uh, I, I would say that there is pretty much unanimous support on this one. Um, I'm just wondering about some of the other issues that were in the Truth and Reconciliation Report. And, and also around uh, the relationship that um, we have with Indigenous across the country. I know that many, uh, I come from a riding with 14 First Nations communities across uh, northern Alberta. Um, and one of the frustrations that's brought up to me often is around um, those band members that live off of reserve and how, how do they incorporate with, with the folks that live on reserve and, and why, why are services that are available on reserve, not necessarily available off reserve. Uh, many of these questions are brought up to me. I recently had a meeting with Denise from my riding, um, and she was bringing that up. Um, and the other thing that she was frustrated was, with was the, f the lack of enforcement of the Financial Transparency Act. She says uh, they recently got a cows and plows settlement, and she says we don't know where that, where that money is going, and she'd really like to know if the Liberals will be enforcing the Financial Transparency Act. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. First, I must say, you know, there are numerous uh, issues 
and it has taken us literally many years uh, in order to uh, get to the point where we are uh, today. And not all issues will be resolved uh, overnight. Um, I, I do believe uh, that we need, for example, to move more on some sort of an urban indigenous uh, strategy in how it is that that would uh, uh, fit in uh, to society uh, moving uh, forward. It's important that we have faith and trust in indigenous leadership uh, and encourage it wherever we can, uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, I appreciate the question and the suggestion from the member that, the, that uh, he would be supporting the job. The Honourable Member for Rivière des Mille-Îles. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thanks for the speech. This is a really great bill, which is of great interest to Quebecers. And we've always been close and interested in pursuing our relationship with Indigenous peoples. Uh, when we talk about the right to compensation, victims are entitled to compensation for the harms done to them, and they should be, their past status should be restored to them, and there should be, they should offer rehabilitation and so on. So that's what the report says. So the block, what do you have to say about the block's motion? Because that's precisely what we're asking for, compensation and an apology from the federal government. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Parliamentary Secretary. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'm, I'm not too sure in terms of the motion, if the member's talking about yesterday's motion. Um, I think that uh, today what we're talking about is uh, reconciliation, truth and reconciliation. And the bill that's before us uh, is a major step, is a significant step in terms of uh, recognizing how important it is that all Canadians have a role to play uh, in, uh, in reconciliation. And I, I would think that that's a, a step forward, as I would anticipate what we would see is many different forms of activities uh, taking place on this statutory holiday, which would be of an educational nature for all of us. Honourable Member for uh, North Island Powell River. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And my question to the member through you, Madam Speaker, is that I do agree with having a National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. I think it's an important step in the right direction. However, what I think is even more important is for Canada to recognize the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous people. And I'm just wondering how long is it going to take for that piece of legislation that is so needed, and we're seeing that across Canada right now, when is that going to be tabled? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, 20 seconds. Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. I think that the, the Prime Minister and the government, in fact, Liberal members of Parliament, have been very clear in support, uh, in support of it, and I suspect it's only a question uh, of time. Uh, there was uh, an attempt uh, previously uh, that made it uh, fairly far, but unfortunately I think it, it, it kind of got stalled at the, at the Senate uh, level. I appreciate the question. Resuming debate, uh, the Honourable Member for Winnipeg Centre. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. I'm honoured to be here today to speak in support of Bill 5 and wish to honour the important work of Sister Georgina Jollibois that initiated the development of the bill and commend the government's effort to ensure that this legislation is realised. This is a critical piece of legislation a small piece of justice as we begin to move forward, learning about the true history of Canada. Stories. Stories I also possess as somebody who's had to work through her own intergenerational impacts. My mother was from Wood Mountain Lakota Nation in Treaty 4 territory in the province of Saskatchewan. Madam Speaker, she was a street kid who ended up in child welfare after my grandmother abandoned her and her younger brother in a motel room in Moose Jaw when she was five years of age. Due to the fact she was the eldest child, my grandmother left her in charge of her younger brother with specific instructions to ration a loaf of bread and a jar of peanut butter and jam for the five days she had to leave them in search for money. 
There were no supports for Indigenous women in the 1930s. There were no social safety nets. There were no human rights. Sexism was rampant and racism was fierce. She had no one to turn to, especially as an Indigenous single mother, and so she left her children. I remember my mother telling me how she, along with her uncle, uh, along with my uncle, gleefully ate the loaf of bread, resulting in a complete depletion of their food ration in only one day. Hungry, scared, and alone, my mother decided to contact the Children's Aid Society. At five years old, my mother had become so street savvy and having no other relatives to turn to at the time, contacted the Children's Aid Society. My mother and her brother needed to eat. They were hungry. But, Madam Speaker, it is beyond most people's imagination, especially those persons who have been privileged with human rights, how a mother could leave her young children in a motel room. It's beyond the minds of many privileged persons to genuinely appreciate what events in my mother's life led her at five years of age to understand how to deal with her and her brother's hunger. My mother knew who to call and how to work with the bureaucratic child welfare system to get fed. She had learned to survive just like my grandmother who had absolutely no resources or supports to assist her. And I'm sure my grandmother's struggle rang so loudly that she couldn't hear the musical and healing reverberations of the jingle dress. The jingles were too faint and muzzled to hear above the noise of the struggle she faced every day. There was no time for healing or inner reflection. She was hungry and alone while the Canadian government willfully perpetrated acts of genocide, making it impossible for her to survive. My grandmother's choice to leave her young children in the room did not stem from a lack of love. Madam Speaker, my, my grandmother started living on the streets as a child and eventually became an alcoholic in adult life as a way to deal with the violent genocide she experienced as an, as an Indigenous child and then woman. Dislocated from her family for reasons directly impacted by the Indian Act of 1876 and the institutional disruptions to my family, including residential schools and the child welfare system, she did not have anyone or anywhere she could turn to. She was not even considered a human being by the Canadian government under the 1876 Indian Act, where they defined a person as any individual other than an Indian. This violent colonial history has often been invisible to settler populations due to the masterful way governments have hidden their dirty little secrets of genocide. Madam Speaker, this has supported a level of cognitive dissonance in Canada that has paved the way forward for ongoing human rights violations against Indigenous peoples. So, Madam Speaker, it's not surprising that many Indigenous people suffer from unresolved colonial trauma today and continue to suffer as a result of the willful human rights violations perpetrated by governments. One only has to look at the number of Indigenous children currently in care, more than at the height of residential schools, to see the long-term impacts of violating Indigenous people's fundamental Indigenous human rights has had on Indigenous nations. The contemporary child welfare system, or what I like to refer it to as the dumping ground for society so that they don't have to see the legacy of cultural, social and family disruption has resulted from colonization. Understanding the impacts of colonialism in Canada is imperative, Madam Speaker, if we are going to move forward in a manner that honours all persons. Going back in our shared history and reflecting on historical disruptions to better understand why things are the way they are today is imperative. For Canada, it's about exposing truth and working through all the cognitive dissonance that keeps it sick. For families and communities that have experienced genocide, it's about relearning how to be together as a family, a community, and a nation. This is the journey I have had to follow trying to understand my grandmother's reasons for causing such pain towards my mother 
who I love dearly. This has been a very difficult journey for me. Madam Speaker, as a result of my family history, for most of my younger years, I grew up without extended family. In fact, we were so void of family connections that my parents asked a close friend if we could call him Uncle Larry. He was not a biological uncle. However, they wanted us to experience having family outside of our own immediate unit. I remember how excited I was to meet Uncle Larry. Madam Speaker, it was my first time ever being able to call somebody uncle. And I remember talking about my uncle, Larry, to my friends. Finally, I was able to participate in playground conversations about weekend family engagements with extended family members. I was not close to Larry. In fact, if I saw him today, I wouldn't even know what he looked like. I don't even remember what his last name was, but our late relationship made me feel normal. I was pretty much without extended relations until my mother's side of the family had a reunion when I was 13 years old, and I was reunited with my aunts, uncles, and cousins who had been separated by child welfare. Madam Speaker, it felt like I had known my relatives my whole life. Our instant closeness, which flowed through our blood members, shared stories of resistance, struggle, survival, hope, pride in our ancestors. We are the descendants of Sitting Bull, Madam Speaker, one of the most revered leaders in North America. Our nation's history is, in fact, has become a Hollywood story often romanticized in movies like Dances with Wolves that choose to, to star a Caucasian woman as the leading Lakota lady. Painted in brown theatrical makeup, she was swept off her feet by the white soldier who was part of the U.S. Army. They fell in love and she willingly chose to leave her family to build a new life with this his heroic white settler. I vividly remember for at least two years after Dances with Wolves was released that any time I mentioned I was Lakota, I would frequently hear, wow, Dances with Wolves. Madam Speaker, that comment would make me nauseous because it epitomized the myth of the kind white settler who lives side by side with Indigenous peoples, resulting in a respectful, lasting, and loving relationships. The great colonial lie. This myth makes a mockery of the violent colonial attacks against the Lakota nation and contradicts historical accounts passed down orally by my ancestors who settled in Wood Mountains after the Battle of Little Bighorn. This battle between the U.S. Army and Indigenous nations, including the Cheyenne Nation, occurred as an act of resistance to the wrongful dispossession of our ancestral lands. Led by Chief Sitting Bull, Indigenous people bravely, bravely fought to defend our lands from the U.S. Army under the barbaric, racist and violent leadership of George Cust General George Custer, white settlers were attempting to encroach on our territory. Although I often hear about the sad death of Custer during this battle in history books, rarely do I hear any discussion about the many women and children who were violently murdered while the army attempted to attack one of our camps. To me, Custer symbolizes the greedy white settler with compromised moral character that stole our lands. Our story was not of great white saviors, but of a massacre led by the racist American army under the leadership of the violent and savage General George Custer. Canada has now celebrated over 150 years as a nation on a stolen Indigenous lands. And talk about reconciliation with Indigenous peoples seems to be coming the new trend, Madam Speaker. However, there's no reconciliation in the absence of justice, and it's becoming clearer that the present Liberal government is unwilling to move beyond mere rhetoric. I become increasingly annoyed each day watching the news, seeing my Indigenous brothers and sisters fighting for justice without action by current governments. Who really needs to reconcile? In the case of the Lakota Nation, our only goal was to stay on our lands, maintain our families and our culture. 
We did what any community would do if a group of people came onto your lands, forcing you to move without cause. Of course, your first course of action would be to defend your lands. Moreover, if the same party continued to willfully violate your human rights, tensions would continue to rise, resulting in a need to take actions. This is exactly what we did. The experience of my beautiful Lakota nation was violent, exploitive, and marked by grotesque violence against our women and girls by our colonizers. Great leaders such as Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull, our women and girls, our children, our grandmothers and our grandfathers were murdered or forced to flee our ancestral land to make room for the settlers. We were forced off the very lands we had lived off since time immemorial and our beautiful way of life was disrupted by violent colonialism. And it's not over. In Canada, governments continue to violate our ways of life with willful and violent acts with almost a complete disregard for our fundamental Indigenous human rights. And this was the kind of violent colonialism my grandmother experienced throughout her lifetime. Madam Speaker, she was born into colonial violence and as a result never lived a life where she was honoured as a life giver and a human being. And unlike the main character of Dances with Wolves, she couldn't wash the brown off her skin and enjoy all the privileges that one's pigment offers. She had to endure the violent racism that was perpetrated against her every day. You know, Madam Speaker, in spite of all her barriers, she survived. And it may not have been a story of my fair lady, but she survived. And that doesn't speak of her weakness, but to her resilience as an Indigenous woman, finding her way through daily human rights violations. My grandmother was a human being, deserving to be loved and to experience joy. This was made impossible through the insidious violence and racism enacted by the Indian Act of 1876. She did not have many choices. You see, Madam Speaker, when you strip a person of the basic necessities they require to have joy, such as housing, food, and safety, growing into a whole person becomes difficult. This was also true for my grandmother, whose life journey was defined by the systemic impoverishment of Indigenous people that began with the dispossession of our lands. Based on justifications rooting, rooted in the doctrine of discovery, they deny our right to self-determination and continue to willfully violate our fundamental Indigenous human rights. It's exactly that belief, enforced through colonial policies and legislation, that left my grandmother homeless. I only met my grandmother twice, Madam Speaker. The last time was when my mother welcomed her to stay in our home prior to a lung operation that would end her life. My mother, in spite of being abandoned in a hotel room, took her mother home. She shared love, compassion, laughter, and care with my grandmother in, in, in her final days of her life, in spite of her own struggles that resulted as a child in care. My mother's kindness come, came from a place of non-judgment, a place of love, and a place of compassion. I remember asking my mom how she could take my grandmother into her home when my mom, and asking my mom how she could take my grandmother into her home when she had abandoned her as a child. And she responded by saying, Leah, my mother was pretty much on her own when she was 12. She was completely alone in the world. She had no rights. She had no way to support herself. There were no social safety nets at the time. She did the very best she could with the tools she had at the time. Madam Speaker, that was the most powerful teaching of forgiveness that I have ever heard in my life. As I sit here and think of my grandmother, the very thought of the isolation she must have felt brings me to tears. How sad that due to racist, paternalistic and misogynistic policies, my grandmother was never given an equal chance to have joy. Instead, her life consisted of finding ways to survive the obstacles of human rights violations that continue to be enforced under the Indian Act and within Canadian policies. My mother deeply understood the realities of my, gra my grandmother faced. 
Madam Speaker, and instead of becoming resentful, she, she focused on the love her mother demonstrated while she was pregnant with her. Although my grandmother was an alcoholic, she sacrificed her addiction to alcohol to support a healthy pregnancy with my mom. I remember my mom sharing, in spite of the fact that your grandmother was an alcoholic, she abstained from alcohol while she was pregnant with me, gifting me with all the physical tools I needed to, in life to succeed. It is for that reason that I will always love her. My mother understood that as a result of colonization, relationships became messy and that ethical decisions extended beyond an individual's choices because injustice left individuals without choices. I often wonder if people could physically see what a heart looks like when it's been broken or wounded. Maybe it would encourage them to be a little bit kinder, a little more gentle, a little less judgmental, a little more loving, a little less hurtful. Madam Speaker, unfortunately, the life of my grandmother reminds me that when you completely dehumanize a person, you can begin to justify unthinkable acts and are able to turn a blind eye to human suffering. I think I carry some of her pain and sorrow in my blood memory. It's the kind of intergenerational trauma that brings on feelings of being unlovable and unworthy of joy. These are the words we learned in Canadian institutions that tried to assimilate us. I still hear those voices in my mind and heart at times, but I have found ways to overpower those voices. It is the resiliency I inherited from my ancestors, the kind of resiliency that emulated through my mother's spirit. And unlike the trauma that overtook my grandmother's life, Madam Speaker, my mother managed to overcome great obstacles. She became a statistical miracle, and, be and, and because of that, I was afforded the good life. Can you imagine living through the trials and tribulation that my mother did and make it out sane? This was in spite of the genocide and a gross human rights violation she experienced early on in life. She was one of the first Indigenous psychiatric nurses in Saskatchewan, award-winning researcher, a scholar, and a social justice warrior who assisted in changing child welfare legislation to support former children in care and rights for persons experiencing mental health issues. My mother was a woman of beauty and grace. I honour my mother and grandmother today. It's a day, one day of remembrance, one day to honour. We need that day, as do thousands and thousands of Canadians who are open to learning about Canada's true and consistently involving history in our relationship with Indigenous peoples. There is no reconciliation in the absence of justice. So I'm here to state loudly, honour this little piece of justice. Thank you.